record on this. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to welcome you to the virtual International Herb Symposium and to uh, have this discussion between Tish and Rosemary about the the, the making of um, the movie, Juliet of the Herbs, and also just the importance of uh, teaching people about using herbs for, for animals. And what an inspiration Juliet was to me as a farmer raising goats, peacocks, chickens, um, and in my, in my personal life, and, and also an inspiration to so many individuals. And I think an important aspect is uh, remembering our elders um, as we take the International Herb Symposium to the virtual world. And I, had, I was telling a, 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 an interesting story about how I, I give these lectures all the time. And, and I recently gave a, a lecture to a group of um, veterinarians who, who practice holistic care for animals. And gosh, they had some of the best questions I've ever had in any lecture. So I, I really feel like this is something Obviously the International Herb Symposium is unique because it's a fundraiser for United Plant Savers, but it's also unique because we hold this space for um, uh, offering classes that uh, look at herbs for animals and veterinarian care. So uh, this is a, a really important aspect of the International Herb Symposium and also to remember the history of, of how we got to this place. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rosemary and, and she'll kick off this wonderful conversation before we show the film. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Yeah, yeah, it's, I'm just honored. I'm really excited to introduce you, Tish, and also excited to be chatting with Tish. We're great friends. We had a lot of adventures, usually around Juliet, um, but we haven't really had a chance to speak with each other for so long. So this is really a great opportunity. And I also have to say how, how honored and excited I am to see that the veterinarian track is continuing because I do feel it's a really important part of herbal education. And it was such a wonderful way to bring the community of veterinarians, um, holistic veterinarians into the herbal community. It was basically in honor of Juliet's work. Um, I felt like there really needed to be more emphasis on animal care. And so really um, it was after Juliet had already passed away, I, I just asked the vets if they wanted to come and be a part of this conference. They had been trying to host their own events, but they weren't having the turnout that they wanted. And I felt like bringing it into the um, heart of the international would definitely give a bigger audience. So um, it's really exciting. It's exciting to see that um, United Plant Savers continuing to include them in that in this great event. So yeah, so I'm happy to introduce you to Streeton. She is the marvelous filmmaker. She's done a number of films, but all of the herbalists know her the most for this um, outstanding film that she created on the life of Juliet. And really, I, I have to say, Tish, um, for all of us who love plants to have this film that you've created, it means that Juliet's life will, will long be remembered. You really brought her her work into such a broad audience. And I always tell every student that I've ever had, and you know, mention it at every conference, that if you are new to herbs and you haven't seen this film, or if you've been studying herbs a long time and haven't seen this film, you definitely have to see it. And it's because it really embraces the life of a passionate elder herbalist, you know, and really um, the life that she lived, which was as extraordinary. So yeah, Tish, you want to just start by sharing, you know how you met Juliet and, you know, maybe your first encounters with her? Yeah, I, I will. But um, first, you just said something. I mean, I think what the appeal of the film and of Juliet, and we can talk, I mean, how we, what appealed to us, but is she covers so many aspects of life and herbalism. She works with herbs, she works with animals, she works, she lived with the gypsies, she lived with Bedouins, she lived with so many people. And I think this broad appeal uh, is what excites people and inspires people. Well, that is what inspired me about her. Um, I mean, I came across her books. I would think I was about 17 years old and I'd just become vegetarian and was interested in whole foods and organic foods. And I was in, I grew up in Oxford I think you know, you've met my family. Yes. And in a very academic, intellectual family. And I walked into the bookstore in Oxford, the Oxford University bookstore, and 
was just browsing and I found this book on the shelves, Juliet's book. And I opened it and before I even read anything, you know, on the, actually, I still have my oh. copy. <laughs> ah. And um, and on the, the, you know, the flap here, it says, oh, she, Juliet, is a busy farmer, botanist, practicing herbalist, soil doctor, tree physician, wanderer in search of the sun. And that's had me. <laughs> it was when I read, oh, someone can write that, as, that they are a wanderer in search of the sun and describe themselves. I didn't have to be a philosopher or an economist. I could be a wanderer in search of the sun, <laughs> which is what I was. But I mean, I think that as well just goes with what I was saying about Juliet is that, you know, she embraced so many aspects of herbs and life and everything that that's her appeal. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's amazing. You know, I, I'm sure that you've told me this story before, but I forgot in my encounter with first meeting Julie, it was exactly the same. I was about maybe 18, possibly 19, and I was trying to find information about medicinal plants and there were so few books. I was at the library yeah. and I stumbled. It wasn't her book wasn't in the herbal section, but I came across it and it's, I can't ever remember if the first book I saw was A Gypsy in New York or Traveler's mm -hmm. Joy. I, it oh, might have been okay. both at the same time, but it was exactly the same thing. It was almost like I opened those books and I, and I fell into a magical world. It was a world that I already was familiar with, but here was a kindred soul, right? Yes. And yes. I just, I, I, I fell in love with her that day in the library. And, you know, I was sort of a young, budding plant lover, right? I, I we didn't even call ourselves herbalists at that time by any means, but um, so I just wrote her this long love letter and I don't really remember what I wrote to her except probably to say like, oh my goodness, I just love your story and I want to meet you and I'm so in love with plants and da 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 da. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sure I tumbled over myself and I sent the letter to her publisher in England, oh, never thinking I would hear from her and really lo and behold, a few months went by and I got a letter back. And so for the next several years, we became pen pals. We wrote back and forth. I kept all of those early letters. Oh, I actually oh wonderful. Yeah. Oh, yes, and, um, must and then write it, the book. Yeah. <laughs> and then it occurred, it was um, I had that I had started my herbal career and um, and I would always write to Julie about everything I was doing. So it was I was in my mid to late 20s, so I was still quite young. And um, I was at the California Herbal School of Herbal Studies, which we'd founded. And I was talking to my good friend, Swabo Brooks, who was also a great lover of Juliet, right? And mm -hmm. I said to him, which I never forget this, I said, we have to go see her before she dies. She's so old. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. and At that time, I think she was like younger than I am now. I think she was in her early 70s. So so that's really what we did. We I organized a trip to go visit Juliet. She was living at that time in Kithra on the island that we eventually all went to. Was she living there when you first started writing to her? I don't think so, actually, um, because that, no, I don't believe that she yeah. was living there at that time. I think, no, I'm quite sure she was still traveling because I know my good friend, Richard Liebman, who was one of the, he was the original executive director of the United Plan Savers. He met Juliet about that same time and she was living in the caves um outside of israel she was like living with um you know just carefree people in these caves um you know just doing her herbal work and healing with animals and stuff yeah she, a remarkable human being this was a remarkable human being without yes. any doubt <laughs> well i'm i never could get hold of her i went around trying like why didn't i think of writing to the publisher i don't know i didn't think of it but i asked people and I wrote her a letter in Israel. I thought when she was living in Israel, someone yes. told me and it came back undelivered or couldn't be delivered. So, yes. And then, in fact, how what how I eventually met her was, yes, I, everywhere I went or well, not everywhere, but occasionally I'd say, oh, do you happen to know Juliet de Barakley Levy? Do you know where she's living? And then I think I was in upstate New York or somewhere at some yes. herb thing. And there was a herbalist and it happened to be Pam Montgomery. And I said, oh, do you, do you happen to know Juliet de Barakley Levy? And she said, no, I don't, but I know someone who does. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Rick Scalso, who then who knew Suevo. 
And that's yeah. how I ended up going on one of the trips with Helen Nearing. Oh yeah, that was awesome. And that's where I first met her. But what was your first impression of her? Because for me, when I read the books, you know, she's very opinionated and strong. And all I had was maybe one little picture of her. And I thought, you know, she was going to be this kind of tall, big woman. <laughs> and, and, and then when I came to kiss her and to her little garden there, and there was this sweet little woman going, Kukumaya, Kukumaya, <laughs> talking to the owls and the birds and everything. It, it just, it was completely different. I mean, it was lovely, and, but completely different to how I imagined her. But I suppose you knew more from your years Maybe, of correspondence. Maybe, yeah, I, I think that she was, yeah, I, I don't remember being surprised by who mm -hmm. she was, except by the incredible levels of complexity, you know, so yeah. there was the Juliet that the world knew, and then there was this incredibly rich, diverse, and complex human being within it that was some, a very challenging individual because she had grown up with such wealth in her life, right, and yeah, and yeah. then had consciously chosen to just leave all of that behind and go into a field that women really didn't do at that time, you know, into her veterinarian work. She was such an original thinker, yeah. um, but, she, but she embraced this complexity of these different worlds that kind of sometimes collided in her, right? So she was like a you mean her she was like wanderer, she was very humble, and then she had this royal queen in there. I was like, so, so that part of it, the, it delighted me actually. It was not always easy that those uh, different levels in her, but I was delighted by this complex individual that was even far more than I had imagined her to be. So she wasn't just yeah. a simple, a, a brilliant, but simple farm woman who traveled the world and lived simply. She was also this elegant royalty, you yeah. know, that was, there was always that part of her that was in there. Yes, but, and that um, was always she was always able to move between all those all those worlds too, yeah. as she said. You know, I mean, I'm not sure that she treated maybe some not the queen's corgis, but something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. She had a lot of good and stories. Then at, <laughs> and then at the other end, you know, there she would be with the peasants and be just as comfortable. But yes, there was all of that. And yeah, I think it's also important to mention, you know, that her herbal work with with people um, is what she was most well known for in the herbal community, but really among the animal world. And what was most dear to her was her work with animals and her earliest books that she wrote about herbalism, like the complete herbal handbook for the um, for the dog and the complete herbal handbook for farm and stable. They were all about you know, they were her about her herbal work with treating animals. And she was really the founder, like all of the early practitioners of holistic veterinarian work and people who were working with animals in a natural way, all of those people would credit her for having been the inspiration behind their work. Some of it, we were talking a little bit about this earlier, sometimes people forget where some of that early foundation of what they're learning now comes from. But she was definitely, she started this work in 1940. And I remember like people would, she told me this, you know, people would say to her, why don't you write books for people? And she'd say, you can just use the books for animals. You know, <laughs> people were, she liked people, but they were not nearly um, her devotion and her love. So you're talking about Juliet and animals. I mean, when I think about what she really, um, what I learned from her most or what I still do to this day, because unlike you, you know, I haven't been a herbalist all my life. I mean, I've been used herbs and for my family and myself, but not in the same sense as you have been. But I have always, since I first read her herbal for the dog, uh, taken care, looked after our dogs with her diet. And when she came here, we made up a little new book called Natural Rearing for Dogs. And, you know, I still, I mean, don't you give your dogs the same, you know, oats, parsley, carrots, garlic, and all the things that she wrote about diet for animals. So uh, I don't know if you have any particular things that Juliet, that you still, well, of course, everything that you do that you learned from Juliet. Oh, yeah, so much. I mean, definitely about animal care, you know, and as I said, like, you know, most of the work that's done now about natural rearing of animals is based on her work. So even- Oh, that's, yeah. 
That, yeah. That's what I wanted to say too. Yes, she was, of course, she was the yeah. pioneer. I mean, people used herbs for animals, yeah. but no one had ever written it down before. Yes. You know, because it was these, the indigenous people, the folk people, the gypsies, the Bedouins, and she learned from them. No one had written any books. I mean, there had been herbal books, you know, whether it was Maud Grieve or Culpepper or whoever, there had been her yeah. books before, but no one had ever written it written it down so she absolutely was the pioneer of animal yeah. herbs <laughs> but but and you had um i don't know how you came across will winter he appears in the film but he's an uh, a vet who i met from the first international symposium and yeah. uh why and that and juliet came there and for me i mean that was when i began filming was at the first international symposium and for me, I feel that was kind of like the beginning of a blossoming of herbalism in America. Or maybe, I mean, it might have been my interpretation <laughs> because I, before I, I met you, that's where I met you too. Before I met you, I, I thought I was the only person that knew about Juliet. I didn't know there were a whole lot of other people. And mm -hmm. then I came to the first international and there were people, they were vets, there was you, there was Deb Soul, there were people that had known her. And it was so lovely for me to be in this big family of other people who knew Juliet. Well, you know, the truth of the matter is, even though Juliet had, had not been to the United States since like the 1950s, when she had come to study with her teacher, um, uh, you know, and also to study with okay. some of the Native mm -hmm. American healers here, like she met Rolling Thunder and another a bunch of other of the Native <coughs> healers, again, on her quest to learn how the indigenous people of the world treated their animals, you know. And um, so she hadn't been to this country since the 1950s, but she had a very profound influence on American herbalism unbeknownst to a lot of the American herbalists, you know, <laughs> just because of the, her books and the influence of her that she had. And there was an enormous following um, among herbalists at that time of Juliet's work. So uh, it actually was, an, uh, it was either the first or second international, it was 1992. And um, I had already gone, I'd taken a group of people to her island to meet her, you know, and had fallen in love with her. And we'd spent like a week <laughs> in her house with her. And, um, and so we were getting ready for this international, I'm pretty sure it was the first international herb symposium. And I wrote her a long letter and, um, or I saw her when I saw her that time, because I went to visit her a few other times, I asked her if she would come and she said, oh, absolutely, she would love to come. Um, I asked her, you know, I get her ticket. She said, well, no, I have a local, um, I have a local travel agent, I'll have, I'll get my ticket. And so the event was coming up, right? And it was, we were two weeks out and I, I still hadn't seen her ticket come through. And it was, a, we had a huge outpouring of people who were coming to that international symposium strictly to see Juliet, like yourself, right? There were, I think we had the largest attendance of international mm -hmm. that year because of Juliet coming to the United States for the first time. Mm -hmm. And so I was getting a little bit worried, like where <laughs> is her ticket and how, where am I supposed to pick her up? So you know this, she, Juliet lived in a home by the Aegean Sea. It had no running water, electricity or anything. So they're, getting in touch with her was nearly impossible. So I had to call a travel agent who got the local taxi, Tarzan, remember Tarzan, him? Yes. <laughs> Go down, drive all the way out to that little <clears throat> tiny village and that little home that she lived and bring her back to the telephone where I waited patiently. And I, I said to her when she came to the phone, I said, Juliet, you know, the international is happening very soon and I've not seen your ticket. And in that incredible Cockney accent that she had with that kind of royalty, this was her royal queen speaking. She said, well, Rosemary, not to worry. I've decided not to come, but don't worry. I've made tapes for you. And I'm sitting there horrified thinking, oh yeah, I can just imagine all those 900 people, right? And me saying, well, she's not here, but I'm putting tapes on. So I just calmly said to the phone, Juliet, pack your bags. I'm coming to get you. So two weeks before the international, I packed my two girl, my my two daughters of the heart, Jennifer and Melanie up. We flew to Greece, went to that little island. She was living at, at Kithara, which at that time was very remote and, and live in that little village and packed her up, got her to the airport. We're getting ready to get on the plane. She's sitting there, you know, with her many layers of clothing and her carpet bags. And we didn't have one of the dogs with us, which was unusual at the time. <laughs> she always traveled with her animals, but 
her <laughs> daughter had flown over and was going to watch her animals for her. And um, we're at the we're at the checkout counter, and the the lady looks up and says, "Well, your papers aren't in order." So uh, yeah, we had to go back oh, to Athens and spend oh two days. Goodness. I had to get her paper. This was typical, though, right? This yes. was really yes. <laughs> and so we made it back to the United States exactly two days. Now I'm the organizer. You have to realize I'm, I'm organizing <laughs> the symposium. I'm putting this whole thing together, and I'm in Greece trying to get passports for this lady. But anyway, oh we got goodness. her to the United States. And I want to say that when I look at the, the things I've done in my life, in my career as an herbalist, this is one of the things I was most proud of is bringing mm. Juliet to the United States because first of all, it gave hundreds of people who had raised their children and their animals yes. um, with her words of wisdom. It gave them the opportunity to meet this woman. And she was as we, you and I had both learned, she was far more than even her books portrayed. I mean, this was a tremendous human being. But <laughs> more than that, even, it gave Juliet a chance to see the her influence her work had had because she had no idea. You know, she was really sadly kind of on her decline yeah. living in that cabin with no energy, nobody to take care of her. It was really sad, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, she's in the middle of all of these people really thanking her and admiring her. There'd be generations, you know, like there, I remember one time we were doing a book signing with her and there were four generations of family members who had all been raised by Juliet's books. So I really was very proud of myself, actually, if I might say so, a little pat on my back. No, I her. think that's lovely. I think that is a wonderful thing you did to get her there. And but you've done it with all the there were other elders there yeah. too, wasn't weren't there? I mean, that was wonderful. Yeah. There was Bernard Jensen and yeah. a whole Norman. Yeah, lot. so many of the elders, you know, yeah. could, their voices weren't being heard and people I felt like people really needed to see where everything that they were studying had been carried on by these people when herbalism wasn't widely popular and you could make a livelihood, you know. These people still love those plants and carried them in their hearts and seeded us, you know, they were the seed balls that seeded us. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I was surprised. I mean, I really do. I mean, I think, yes, that was brilliant of you to bring her and and she stayed. I mean, she stayed for almost. <laughs> Talk about years. Your, your 20 years. <laughs> there were you and I trying to find her places. To, I mean, she stayed with you. She stayed with me. And then when we couldn't have her anymore, you know, you and I would find her places to live. And of course, everyone would love to have her. Uh, However, <laughs> yeah, it was always, it's very true what Trish is saying. You know, Trish and I would take, we took a lot of responsibility because she was elderly and she needed a lot of care at that time. And um, we, she spent a lot of time with both of us at our homes. We, we were very grateful for that time, but yes. you know, yeah. was caring for an, for an elder. And there were also always people who wanted her to stay. And Tish and I would just like we would we would you know kind of go over their qualifications, and then we Tish and I would always have, well, I think she might last like four days here, <laughs> maybe a week there, <laughs> because you know again because yeah. it's difficult. <laughs> Uh, it's often difficult for people to to care for elders and then Juliet also as, as marvelous and as amazing as she was she was also that you know that queen like being <laughs> yeah and that was like your story of going to get her I mean there were lots of moments like that in the making of the film when she would just go okay no oh I won't do this yes I you can just use some of these tapes or you can do this this or something and it's you know, you had to really keep her <laughs> on on track because well, let's talk about the film for a minute, Tish, because it really I I know I've seen other of your films and you are a really, really good filmmaker. And I know that you've been working on one on Tulsi too. But I'm all, I'm really curious, maybe just to share a little bit. Well, I'd like to know the inspiration for the film, why you decided, of course. I know I guess just because it was Juliet, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And your interest in animals and plants. Yeah. But also, well, if you wouldn't mind sharing some of the, you know, challenges and also some of the real gifts that you received from doing the filming. Hmm. Well, I start. I actually started the idea for a film. I mean, of course, uh, came when I did a film course before I was going to live in Sicily, and I wanted to film uh, the people there and what they were doing. But our teacher in the film course asked, "Oh, well, what would you want to do a film about?" and 
I said, you know, just the first thing that came to my mind, well, was Juliet, because of oh. course she's lived such a colorful life. And, you know, wouldn't it be fun to go make a film, go travel where she's been and do all of those things. And so I said this to the class and it kind of fell flat. This was like in the mid seventies. It was like, well, no one knew who Juliet was so or anything about her. So it was like, oh, that's not a very exciting film. <laughs> I mean, you have really? to know you have to know her books and you have to know her to be excited. And then there was another film I was going to make about bread around the world. And everyone thought, oh, that's great and enthusiastic. <laughs> and it was so funny because, yes, I mean, I think it was the time as well. You know, yeah. as you said, yeah. it, herbalism hadn't really caught on. It wasn't a very exciting thing for most people at that time. But anyway, I had that in, that was before I'd met her or knew her. So I kept that in the back of my mind all the, for many years until I did finally meet her. And then, well, the, uh, the challenges, as you say, were just, you know, Juliet's personality and <laughs> <laughs> stubbornness. And no, I'm not going, to, there's one scene you'll see where she's standing typing at the typewriter in her room in, in Kithara. And I remember, I, I can't remember why she was very cross at that moment. Uh, you know, she probably didn't want to be doing the film or she thought she could do it some other way. And she was typing really like this, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't show, it doesn't show up in the <laughs> yeah. film. That's a little background behind the scenes information. Um, but uh, no, one of the best stories I mean, while making it just because it was Juliet, there were millions of magical moments. I mean, there were owls everywhere. I mean, I always associate Juliet with owls. They appeared everywhere. And then we kind of bumped into families of gypsies wherever we went, that was just lovely to film. But we were driving in Spain and we were going up to the village where um, Spanish mountain life, here's the book. Yeah. which is uh, which tells the story of uh, when Juliet gave birth to her daughter Luz and uh, Luz was very ill and she found some you'll hear it in the film she found some opium poppies and gave them to Luz and she recovered and then she had to be she couldn't breastfeed her so she gave her to the gypsy Rosario to suckle and then later to a goat but but anyway, we were going back to this village, which as we drove up was now like a big bustling town. And I was driving along and I rolled down the window to ask someone, um, oh, do you know where the old stone mill is where Juliet used to live? I'm, I had no idea if they'd even know, know it, but I rolled down the window and this woman looked in and she looked like this and she went, Juliet! <laughs> And it was Rosario, the gypsy who Juliet knew, sister. Oh my and she God. took us immediately in the midst of this huge now town to Rosario's place. Oh. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that <laughs> so, is amazing. That's the so thing, thing. Oh, and then, of course, there's my story of the when we got to the Azores. Oh. That, um, you, <laughs> you remember this one. And, um, and I was looking. I'd always wanted to sail across the Atlantic. And uh, so I thought, oh, good, I'll go back from the Azores to the US in, in a sailing boat. But it was the <laughs> wrong time of year. Uh, the, you know, the currents were going the wrong way. But then just before I was about to leave, uh, someone told me, oh, there's a boat pulled in at the dock and it's going, it is going to, to America. So go down and see what it is. And I went down and the boat was called Juliet. <laughs> So yeah. I sailed back home to America on Juliet. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, I remember that so much. Yeah. We, um, Tish and I actually made uh, a couple of journeys to the Azores, yes. West with, with Cascade. Um, and we would go to yeah. visit Juliet there. And just, yes, you know, she, yeah, yeah, she moved there. People often ask at the end of the film, they say, oh, where is that, that Juliet's 11th garden is? And it was in the Azores. Yeah, the Azores is so yes. beautiful there. It was just, it was like a paradise. and. Yeah. Of course, when Juliet well, would got... always go back, you know, yeah. everything had changed so much. So she would like be a little, always disappointed. It's like when we go back to, you know, visit our home where we grew up yeah. and there's 
they're now teeming with houses and cars and roads. And so we would go there and it was very relaxed and it seemed very, very rural. But Juliet was remembering it from, you know, the 1940s or the 1950s. But so she stayed there quite a, quite a bit in the latter years of her life. And we would go, we would all take turns to go and help her. And this one trip, it was Tish and Cascade and I just going to have a, you know, just a, I think we were there for a week or a week and a half with Juliet. And one, this one day, Ju uh, Juliet, there was a lot of jellyfish, actually, <laughs> so Portuguese man of war is even flo floating around in the ocean. And Juliet was telling us, you know, the best remedy for this, of course, is urine, you know, if you get stung. So it was like, actually, one of the last mornings, Tish and I went down, Cascade, for some reason, didn't come with us. And we went down to the pool to swim. And the pools are actually just part of the ocean. They're like big volcanic pools. Mm -hmm. They put grates on one side so that the big fish and stuff, sharks and things don't come in. <laughs> And there we were, we were floating. It was like being in heaven. We were floating in this incredible waters. And all of a sudden I felt like this piercing beam mm. of light come into my chest. And I had been stunned by this big jellyfish. It was turned out it was a Portuguese man of war, the worst kind, oh. right on my chest. And Julie and Tish is there and she's like dragging me out of the water and lays me <laughs> on the edge of the public beach there and leans over and pees on me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. Oh yeah, <laughs> I then, <laughs> so true. It was so so true. And then, then the second part of this. So you helped me back up to the house. It was just a. She was. We were staying in that Let's beautiful see it, garden. Geez. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And um, Cascade immediately being a good herbalist, you know, and all the millions of remedies, she lays me down in the garden and she gets a big gob of honey and she smears it all over my chest and we're surrounded by bees all of a sudden. And I'm just thinking, oh, leave me alone, leave me alone. <laughs> but I woke up a few hours later completely healed. Thanks for that good <laughs> washing from Tish and the honey. honey. <laughs> You don't remember that story? Oh, no, I remember you being stung. Definitely, I don't remember being. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I, don't think I, may, I don't think I imagined that. No, no, that's no, really. Funny. No, it, it it could have if we knew. I always thought that urine was good for the, you know the sea urchins, those prickly things. I didn't yeah. know it was good. Yeah. <laughs> but if so Julia, okay. Julia had just shared that with us, you know, she yes. was telling us in case we did get but, stung. She was uh, so wise. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that was nice of you to let me. <laughs> <do>. <laughs> you know, I have little kids that you chew up plantain and they don't like it because they go, Ugh, it's been in your mouth. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been wonderful sharing with you, sweetie. Yeah. It's like so, so incredible. And I want to really thank you again for, you know, just creating this magnificent film it's it's actually one of my favorite movies i i have to share one one thing and i'm sure you'll have a few last things you want to share as well but in juliet's latter years you know um when she was really getting quite elderly she would love to go down into my library in the evening and watch films that was what she would always do every yeah. night we would sit and watch a film together and she had two films that she would watch only two there was only two that she would watch one was a secret garden <laughs> and the other was Juliet of the herbs. And I think I must've watched it about 150 times with her. It was like, I go, don't you want to see something else? Secret garden or Juliet uh, of the herbs. She loved that film. You know, she loved yes. to sit there and watch it. And uh, one of the things that I appreciate about it, you brought her life. You, you, ex you know, you showed the broad spectrum of, of her life and, you know, the influences she had and, you know, just a lot of the magical things like her life with these indigenous people and the gypsies, et cetera. Um, and that part I thought was so incredible. Um, and also just bringing it to such a large audience, which I mentioned in the beginning, you know, really capturing this film so that her life does live on. I really want to thank you and honor you oh. for that. So well, thank you. Thank you for showing it to people. You're the one as you brought her here and you did all of that. So um, but yes, I remember she I was that ple I was very happy that she liked it. I mean, yes, I got sick. I wouldn't have <laughs> her watching it <laughs> too. that secret garden too. But um, yeah, of course, that was lovely that she did, even after all of those resistance in the making of the film, that she was happy and liked it was was very yeah. nice. No, that's all I think. I don't know. Well, I'll just I'll just jump in here as we wrap up. But I thank you, Susan. I really 
I really feel like she's timeless and, and, and the movie is of course timeless. And the message is so important because we are deeply out of balance with our relationship with the environment and with the animals. Yeah. And that's something that she speaks about. And I feel like the consciousness of young people, you know, what we're realizing with COVID and um, zo zoonic diseases that, you know, viruses moving from animals to people because nature's out of imbalance and how we view one health how the health of our environment, how the health of our animals is all connected to the health of humans. And for me, you know, the movie is so critical because in this time of COVID, we, we have to realize that we have to treat animals um, with the respect that we treat ourselves and our own family and, and our environment. And so um, what's been really fascinating is during this COVID time, right? People what have people turned to? They, they've adopted animals. Mm -hmm. All yeah. the shelters were, 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 were empty, you know, and, and people started growing houseplants. And these That's are the hard. things that, that comforted us, you know? So yeah. um, we're, we're realizing the factory farming industry has to end. We're realizing that when we take care of mm -hmm. animals, we take care of ourselves, we take care of our environment. And, and so that's why I, I'm just so thrilled to have you both, um, you know, talking about this movie. I hope we bring in a new generation of, of young people that will be inspired um, by, by her wisdom and by her books. Uh, this, is, this is the work of our time, you know, and, and we're carrying it forward. So, so true. Uh, thank, you, thank you both. And, and I hope whoever watches the movie has a moment where they're, where they're crying and, and they're also laughing um, and, and realizing that they can they can uh, do things in their lives that improve their relationships with um, all beings, right? Absolutely. So lovely. Anyway. lovely. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Susan. Yeah, thank you. Enjoy the movie. Get a bit more popcorn and have <laughs> fun. Popcorn. Yeah, yeah. Get your <laughs> okay. Lovely. See you later. Okay, we're gonna end it. Thanks, guys. Okay, bye.